seeing here is, is, is the, the Boulder Ultimate Fourth of July uh, uh, Ultimate Frisbee Tournament, and it's been going on. This is 12th season, um, and what we're looking at here is the semifinals of the women's division. There's a women's A, a men's A, and men's B, which is over at Southern Hills right now. Finals are going on uh, for men's B. Um, right here, we're looking at uh, Ozone from Atlanta and Deviate from Boulder, Colorado. Um, these two teams have worked their way up. We played a round robin format in the first part of the uh, um, first part of the team. Um, nine teams. Everybody plays everybody, and so they, were, they each had eight different games, and they qualified for the semifinals. Deviate was uh, uh, ranked number one coming into this. Atlanta was ranked number four, so they're playing so, a crossover. Talk to us a little bit about the game. Okay. The game is is in, in the playing field. Okay. How big is this playing okay. field? And where sure. are we? We're in okay. Boulder, Colorado, right now we're of course. In Boulder, Boulder, Colorado. On the CU campus at Kittridge mm -hmm. Fields. Um, ultimate Frisbee game played with seven people on each side, 70 yard playing field with 25 yard end zones. The field is 40 yards wide. Very similar in length to a football field, but mm -hmm. but wider end zones to accommodate the throwing of the, of the disc and all. What's, what's the objective and of the game? The objective of the game is to work the disc down. You cannot travel with the disc or walk with the disc, so you have to establish a pivot foot like basketball. Mm -hmm. um, very similar uh, to football. You have a, a kickoff or a, a pull they call it, a throw off, and they'll throw the other team, the other team will try to work it down. If the disc happens to hit the ground or drop, it's a turnover and it goes the other direction immediately. There's a throw off, they often throw angles like, that's a drop. So it hit, hit her before it dropped and so it's a turnover. Okay, they, they have to let it hit the ground first before uh, um, before play um, before play begins. So that was a that was a, a, a brain lapse by that girl that let her hit her hit her uh, before it hit the ground. Um, do, so do people take drugs like before they play frisbee and too many trails? <laughs> no, not no. at this level, right? <laughs> not at this level. Um, these guys, no, I, I'm going into that. All right. um, <laughs> you could go into it. Um, um, you know, we're definitely looking at an alternative sport. This, this is um, flying disc uh, sports in general. Uh, there, there's like eight different events or eight different disciplines in flying disc sports. Uh, disc golf is as can, can tremendous. You, let me interrupt. You. No, okay. I can't see anymore. Let me move it up here. Not too far. Stay off the field. That had just received the disc about five yards from the goal line. She's going to work it down. Um, disc golf is, is a very popular disc sport also. Probably has close to as many numbers as Ultimate does. Ultimate is the other big discipline in, in, uh, um, in the sport. Uh, Ultimate has probably somewhere around 6,000 uh, active uh, players in the Ultimate Players Association, which is the, the umbrella organization for the sport. Um, we should we should tell everybody who we're talking okay. to. So widen your shot okay. up and let's just step out here. Come here okay. and, and uh, you right. introduce yourself. My name is uh, Bill Wright. I'm the, the tournament director for the Boulder Ultimate Fourth of July. Uh, been involved with the sport for uh, with disc sports anyway for about 15 uh, years. Playing myself uh, in, in freestyle frisbee, which is a little bit different. Bill, why aren't we seeing this on ESPN2 or Prime or, or ESPN1? Um, we, we do occasionally. You know, we just it just doesn't it doesn't uh, usually um, the way those those stations are taking it right now is that they'll take a um, uh, kind of a uh, an approach to where they'll put it on once a year, mm -hmm. and so they'll take one tournament and put it on, and uh, so that's why you don't see it a lot, but you you see it occasionally. It's you know my guess is that that we're going to start to, it's going to break the threshold as uh, as alternative sports take start taking grip you're going to see ultimate pri probably take hold first um, because it's it's exciting it's everybody can relate to it everybody's played some sort of frisbee football in some time of their life there's more frisbees sold each year than footballs basketballs and baseballs put together so um, there, there's a lot of disc play going on th out there people can relate to the to a disc can can you tell us a little bit now play by play um, action what's going sure, on who sure. are the two teams and, and okay. what's going on um, we got ozone atlanta um, in what color in pink and uh, we got dv8 in white um, there's no officials on the field it's a self official game um, there, there's a very strong movement to keep it that way um, always some discussion about having officials on the field but even at the its highest level in the semifinals of a very prestigious tournament it's self officiated there's certain pr procedures that take place if a foul is called it goes back to the thrower it just depends on the situation if it's if it's uh, disputed then it goes back if it's not disputed then it stays there so this is sort of a so, gentlemanly game or a womanly game or um, a, yeah it, I mean that, 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 the thing is spirit of the game I mean that, that that's what we 
we call it an ultimate. And, and the spirit of the game is that, that it is a friendly game and, and uh, um, it's not supposed to be a contact sport. There is a, is a fair amount of contact, especially when you start watching the men's finals. You'll see um, you know, the, the, the positioning and, and things taking place like, like football and they want to get position on a player. But you know, it's similar type of rules. You can't, you can't interfere with a person that has um, a person that has uh, a position to a disc. Um, you have to play the disc, you can't play the man um, or the woman. Uh, now what's going on here? Right now, DV8 just scored down at the other end. Um, I think they're up by a couple couple goals right DV8 now. DV8's in white. DV8's in white. They're going to they're gonna throw off to, uh, um, to Atlanta. Um, Ozone. Which um, is down, the, down the, in the paint. In the paint. Yeah, that's right. And um, so when you say they're looking to throw up, what's going to happen? So, so they, they, they're going to be, they're going to pull. And they're, they're, they're required to, to tow the line, so they have to stay behind the disc thrower. The disc thrower throws from the goal line. Okay. If if the disc on the pull does not stay within the end zone area or within the playing area, we have a brick rule. It goes out of bounds. They take it to about 15 yards ahead of the goal line and they start play from the middle of the field there. So they, it really is a purpose in this pull to keep it within the playing field. Okay. Um, and, then, and, and now what are they going to do once, once they receive it? Okay, once the they receive it, the person that catches it or picks up the disc first establishes a pivot foot, just like basketball. From where you stand, you cannot travel, you cannot take steps forward, only your momentum uh, when you start play. Okay, so she's going to take that disc or let it drop in the end zone. She can, goes ahead and catches it. She could either walk the disc to the goal line or immediately throw it. Okay, so she whipped the disc up and she kind of threw that one up. We call that a hospital throw because there's see how many people uh, get get uh, get down there and, and can collide into each other with that. Okay, so they so that was a turnover. It landed. They missed it. They didn't complete the pass. It could have either been intercepted or hit the ground, and it's a turnover. And now, guarding like you guard basketball. Yep, very similar. And you can't double you know, no uh, double guard. Is that an um, that was, a, that was a defense. So it, you know it hits it. She didn't actually intercept it, but she. Uh, um, I'm having a little bit of a huck fest here. They're just going for it. And that was nice defense. She had position. So all she needs to do is get the disc to hit the ground. She doesn't have to catch it. And now it's her disc. And so they can they can either hustle and try a, more of a fast break technique, or they can they can set up a play. You know. So right now she's she made the made the great D, and, and they have specific handlers and positions on the field. So they, they their handler goes back to pick up the disc, and she'll be able to bring that disc up to the goal line to start play. And see now they've stacked. Stack the alignment. What they've got is a, um, um, a set play coming up, or actually what they'll do is have a set number of cutters. There'll be, uh, um, they, they've called out the name, so she's cut number one. They'll fake to her, and if she doesn't get it, they'll, they'll throw to the open person and, and try to work the disc up the field. And um, basically they, they'll have handlers, middlers, middle players, and long. The handlers will stay back. Oh, they missed the throw on that one, so it's a turnover. Um, Let's get it it's, back, it's, a, it's a game of patience, you know, the, back, uh, and you'll see that in the men's division a little bit more. Where they'll work the disc for a long time and and not force it up up the field so much in order to keep the keep possession and try to get that good throw. So um, now now Ozone's got it, and they'll try to work it up. Um, it's a little bit risky to try to throw into traffic like that. They, they seem to be rushing it quite a bit. And then DBH rushing it too. They had the opportunity. And the fast break is usually you know, a big, big advantage. Uh, Can you the offside, sir? Uh, no, there's no offside like in hockey or anything like that. So now, now is a turnover. They again, no, how, again, how do you score the goal? Of of where's, where's Just the one goal? point past the, this set, this cone here. Which cone? There? The, the first cone there is the is the goal line. It's, uh, it's a little bit hard to see. So, okay, so that's the cone. And so what does that mean? That means if somebody runs one point. With it? Nope, you can't run it. Oh, you cannot run it. Yeah. How many steps are you? Yeah, you should show me like two or three steps. This girl right here, yeah. you know, that could have been talk all traveling. And what that would do is kind of stop play, and she had to go back to the position she caught it. It's so not a turnover. Or you have to. Is it called passing? Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. You have to throw the disc. Okay. Yeah. You can't run with the disc at all. And, and essentially, where you catch it is where you establish your pivot foot. And you have just one pivot keep foot. Rolling, keep and, um, you know, I think somebody has uh, has called this, a timeout here. Is he a coach? Um, he um, he plays for. Uh, um, I think he's a husband or a boyfriend. Okay. okay. <laughs>
So he's a, they, they have lots of helpers, and it's you know with a with a young sport like this, it's it's not like you have you know they're they're not paid players. It's not a professional sport. It's still at, at, at an amateur level with uh, with everybody involved, and and uh, so they, they have their own captains and their own leaders that they've established, and and somebody that calls out the the um, the different uh, people that go into the you know once once you call a timeout, you can substitute two players, and um, so they'll call out the uh, uh, the new people into the lineup. Now what's going on here? Now? The, the action is stopped. Somebody called the timeout. And, oh. and so the, and what they're doing is just going over, you know, uh, I think, you know, they were in disarray there. Both of them were rushing the disc up the field and, and just hucking it, we call it, so in, yeah. instead of working it a little bit more. So your last name is what? Your bill? Right. Bill Wright. Okay, let's come back okay. here. Okay. Okay, one up here. Okay, we're, so we're talking with Bill Wright today on uh, Jan Scott tonight. Uh, Ultimate Frisbee. This is Fourth of July weekend here in Boulder. And if you wonder uh, what you're watching, it's probably the first time on the television that you're seeing an Ultimate Frisbee match. So this is the I thought, oh, what the hell, we've been wanting to cover this kind of stuff in uh, uh, alternative sports on TV since nobody else is doing it. No sooner or later, ESPN2 or uh, somebody will pick it up and, and then we'll be out of the picture and we'll be on to something else. Like starship battles. It's got to start somewhere. And, 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 you know, we, we appreciate the opportunity to get involved at, at whatever level. Now, these teams came down for the No, no I mean, it's, it's a total expense to them to come down. And, you know, as a tournament director, I just provide you know as many things as possible. It's an entry fee of, of twenty dollars per person to play. Is this an amateur sport? Or yeah. Are we no, it's, a, it's an amateur sport. I mean, there there have been money tournaments, but I would I wouldn't call them professional sports yet at this time. You know, there's nobody out there that's there's no franchises, there's no sub teams, there's no uh, there's no. Uh, um, uh, there's no real money in it. I mean, even if there was a prize money tournament, overall these these girls and these guys have paid a lot of money to travel around the country and, and compete in, in the sport because they love it. You know, I mean, it's, it's, it's for the mostly, love of the sport. Are these mostly college students? Or just, um, no, actually, this is club sports, and and the club sport level is probably I, I would say age ranges in the, the low twenties to to the low thirties. So um, you know. 20 to 20 to 35 age range and, and, and most of these girls and tons of young players coming up there's tons of play at the high school level right now and uh, the college level it's very very uh, organized and, and as far as an alternative sport frisbee is uh, amazingly well organized yeah i would say so just because uh, come on dva home field advantage you got the legs it's via universities and via via situations like that so uh, um, I think that, that that's one of the reasons. Although, um, although frisbee is uh, is accessible to all levels, just because it's a very inexpensive sport to play. It's a seven dollar frisbee. I mean, anybody can play it. It's, it's no problem. Are these your uh, these your kids here? Yeah. We're in the middle of the games. Do you want to play, Marley? Swing it, go! Can you say hi? Oh, that was a good catch. Back to the action. Can your whale say hi? Go, hit it, hit it! So BDH working the, working the disc down the field. Right now. They've got to be patient. They've got to, they've got to, they're close to the goal line, so there's a lot more players in the way. And she's got a good break. <laughs> yeah, Laura Perot! Woo! 14-9, keep rolling! 14-9, uh, DDA over Ozone right now. What's game two, Katie? 17 or, or 15? 15? Okay. Games to 15 is 14-9, I believe. So, DDA's on game point. Game point, then? Game point, 14-9. So, so yeah. DV8's got an obvious advantage wide here open. because she's well, got a chance to And white. Uh, DV8 and white, yeah. and both the team from Boulder, yeah. um, you know, they've got. Uh, this is the Boulder. Team. They've got a five point lead right now, and all they've got to do really is be patient, and, and they're in the final. So, they, they pretty much dominate the tournament. What's the. Um, yeah. To win the game, how many points? Just get to 15 points. Right? 15 points. They, they, they may play finals to, it made to look, more. You look very bad. similar to pick up basketball. <laughs> yeah, very similar. And, and yeah, whoever's saying attention saw what happened. Yeah, in the way that it's set up. Yeah. And, 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 or volleyball. Yeah, exactly. And the way that it's standing there. It's a point of goal. Looks like a soccer field. It's really exactly the same size as a football field.
field, except for the, the playing field is 70 yards instead of 100 yards, but the end zones are 25 yards. Can you talk about the end zone? Okay, um, you know, essentially it's, it's very similar to soccer equipment, soccer uniforms, although, you know, certainly we're an alternative sport, they wear what they want to. Usually girls will, and guys will bring a dark shirt and a light shirt to a tournament, and, and they've, they've established their own identity, and, and uh, um, you know, at, at certain times we've, um, the sport has required them to wear numbers and things like that for identification, and eventually that's probably going to be, if we ever do get to the point where we got regular, regular TV coverage, then you are going to need that kind of thing for identification and things like that. So, but it's a, uh, but it's essentially it's a very free sport, and, and so they're very free spirited individuals, yeah. and, and they're part of the, the beginning of the sport. Get our get our clothes. Yeah. Get our clothes. Get our clothes. Yeah. I have just a little bit. Yes. Um, and then explain this game. It's almost the end. Okay. When you do that, you got to pull back and loosen up. Can't. Did you see that was rainy? Watch her! No! It's shoulder back on! Shoulder back Oh! Yeah! Yeah, yeah! Yeah, Foster! Oh! Okay, DV8 wins the game. So dv now in the finals. Switch sides? Um, they, they, yeah, they, you switch sides automatically. When when you score a goal, you stay there. Uh -huh. You make it. You, you stay there. So um, in, in that in that way, you switch sides each time. And they do have a halftime, and they'll you know mirror image. One team that, that, that pulls to begin the game, the other team will pull to the next half. Uh, thanks for talking with us. Today. Sure. Spending some time here on that. No problem. On the TV show. It's a family game. <laughs> it's a, it is a family game, huh? That's right. That's right. A lot of fun. So it'll be a good time to go get some reaction from the from those girls because they're side. And they just they just made it into the finals. And they're, uh, they've been waiting a long time for that. And the, the other good thing to get is their cheers because they'll cheer the other team. They'll they'll they'll, they'll do a they'll do, do a cheer, kind of saying thanks for uh -huh. playing. Really. And, uh, uh, so they're doing that right now. Yeah, they'll get together, they'll talk about it, and then they'll turn around to the other team and they'll cheer them. That's bad. Are the men's and women's finals going to be simultaneous? Um, you know, whatever whatever they want to do, you know, my guess is that they don't really want to. Um, I suspected that the women would be done first. Yeah. And, uh, but but now that they're they're done, the men have been ready to go. So my guess is we can start men's and, and we'll stagger it. Over. You know, it'll cross over a little bit, but it'll, uh -huh. it'll, uh, hopefully we can stagger it so yeah, hope so. we can watch both of them. Yeah, I'd like. Okay. <laughs> I don't know if we can wait till the finish of one uh -huh. and start another. <laughs> Sure, we can be. We're just we're taking no, 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 this for no, the no, television. No, 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 I thought <laughs> we're just kidding. <laughs> what happened? Yeah, and uh, these ladies actually do want to be interviewed. All right. They probably don't. What uh, should we talk about? We should talk about the greatest player in the history of the sport. Yeah, the greatest player. That would be David Gessner. 
Is that right? Like Who is that? The greatest, greatest liquor blocker ever. <laughs> the greatest player. Please see the back of this shirt. Over. So that puts you in the finals. You must be pretty psyched about this. <laughs> no. Come on. Hey, hey. Respond. Be camera you ready. We, are. we have Ganya. Ganya. We have Ganya. We have Ganya. So we're going to do it. We are going to do it. David Gessner is so famous, he's the only Ultimate player to have been permanently banned from the Washington, D.C. Ultimate. <laughs> ever. Well, I'm glad we get back to the important subject. Can I get the back of this shirt? We're also in the final fight. Uh -huh. How are you? Air liquor, that's good. Uh-huh. Stephanie, you're the Ultimate player. So, Vanna, we got to both win for Boulder, and then we're going to have a big party tonight. So when are you going to do your cheer here? <laughs> yeah, Katie! Yeah, girls! I hope you got a hug. Hey, Katie, I'm reserving you a shirt, so I hope you win this. I only have five left. All right. All they are is extra large and extra large. <laughs> there she is. I love her. Come here. Hey, Cooper. Watch out. Hey, Jen, you're there. Great. Right. All right, Kimbo, I'm going to go out. Anything you want? Oh, man, we're all here. I just I was like, oh, I it's Tuesday if I'm there, I kind of feel like I need a break, but... Well... I kind of like the singer and toenail, it really hurts. It's nice to do a break. Instead of taking a hey JJ. Today we're at Europa Institute on Jan Scott tonight. All the famous uh, beatniks are going to be here. Uh, Allen Ginsberg, Ken Kesey, uh, Gary Snyder, etc. Poets and uh, beat stuff. Sitting down over here right now, waiting to get going. and We'll go over and tape some of the dedication for the new library. I'm Jan Scott, you're watching Jan Scott tonight, here live in Boulder, Colorado, on the Europa Institute campus. Oh, you like my new shirt? Fair I can. Yes. accepted it and turned it into all of our financial offices. So if you're registering or haven't registered or haven't paid for classes, you'll want to know that the registration office, the bursar's office, and the financial aid, if you're a program student, offices are all located on the main floor here. Oh, hi, Ginger. How are you? <laughs> Ginger Perry, famous. Uh, uh, Ginger, I'll get you on camera. Famous. Uh, my glasses. Christian rock and roll from Right. Oh, uh, my TV show. I'm <laughs> 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 
little more. <laughs> So it's a great, a great honor for the Lamas to be here today uh, for the opening of down. the Allen Ginsberg <laughs> Library. We last saw him in New York City where we shared the stage with him uh, on Carnegie Hall and uh, with Philip Glass and uh, Natalie Merchant, uh, 10,000 Maniacs, a number of a number of people is all doing a, a, something for Tibet, so it's, it was a very great pleasure. And for many years, Alan has been involved with Tibetans and with the Tibetan spiritual tradition. So it just happened that we were in Denver, and we're doing a performance there tonight, and I spoke to Gaelic Rinpoche, who is one of Alan's dear friends, and Gaelic said, please come up and, and uh, say hello to all uh, the peoples here and do a brief prayer that the, uh, the library here will have its full impact. So. Uh, just great, great pleasure. So they're just essentially going to do what in Tibetan is called like opening the doors. It's kind of a prayer that the library will achieve full greatness and will always be uh, very active and fruitful and useful for, for everyone who uses it. So, Tenerimchi Peronam, Tata, Ati, Their monastery, Drepung Losaling, was the largest in Tibet with about 10,000 monks. They're most famous for the multiphonic singing tradition, and they, in Tibet, led all of the great festivals of multi uh, national festivals with the multiphonic uh, overtoning.
sidling up to trustees and saying, we need to name the library, well, who do you think? And they would go through almost instantaneously a similar process, from the founder to anonymous to Alan. Oh. I uh, decided not to call him. <laughs> and Barbara Dilley, the president at that time, called him, and it's a conversation which none of us were privy to, but she reported back, not that he said yes, but that it was okay. I'd like to thank uh, Zegar Confer Rinpoche and uh, Eagle Cruz for attracting the drawers to this ground. I would like to uh, also thank the Building and Grounds Committee, in particular Emily Hunter, dedicated to Allen Ginsberg.
I'm delighted to be able to uh, introduce a good friend of Naropa, and uh, not just a uh, political friend at all. She has been uh, a speaker at graduation and quite involved with us over the years. I'm very honored to be here today to celebrate the growth of Naropa, the opening of the library, and the real contributions that Naropa and all of you make to our community, to our education, to our spiritual life, and to our knowledge about things that are far greater than us. It's also a great honor today to declare Allen Ginsberg teacher, and we're very blessed to have you here today with us. Alan, uh, respected monks, I did not know I was speaking here today till now. You and me, Don. <laughs> but, uh, I'm very happy to be here at this special ceremony. I've been in Boulder during the founder of this institution, 
So the quality of land, no use, I'm speaking in Tibetan, because uh, very few people are here. So the quality of the learning, Buddha compared as a, one of the best friends. Friend will not let you down when you are down. And it is well. No one can steal from you. And it is the path which will deliver the truth, including the light. So it is great to be here. I'm very happy. And I thank you for everybody here inviting me. And I thank you for having the monks who have instantly not dedicated to helping all other beings sincerely, whether you are artistically or not. What I mean is, and uh, so it is very appropriate. Thank you so much. Do we have the best rooms? Maybe Shelley, you can come up and help display them. Uh, Sandy Berrigan who was associated with this institute, had been a visitor here some years ago, uh, had also been married to the poet Ted Berrigan, who was quite active with our poetic school, has um, sewn these vestments for Alan that we will now uh, present. And Ansel Hollow, who's on our core faculty. This second gift, is a new Buddhist vestment representing your work in the world for peace and also your own growth as a Buddhist. These gifts, which are designed both as garments to be worn and works of art, are not the product of my hands alone. The drawings on both pieces are by Mendocino artist Gary Grace, calligraphy and fringes executed by Rab Rabbi Margaret Holub, and thanks to Skip Taub for inspiration and interpretation of the symbols in Buddha Mother. I hope this day is one of peace and gladness and that the library will be a source of inspiration and information and pleasure for all who enter it. That's basically uh, composed of quotes, more quotes. <laughs> As for the books you mention, if their content is in accordance with the book of Allah, we may do without them. For in that case, the book of Allah more than suffices. If, on the other hand, they contain matter not in accordance with the book of Allah, there can be no need to preserve them. <coughs> Proceed then and destroy them. Signed, Caliph Omar. Plutarch, beware the man of one book. 
So the books were distributed to the public baths to feed the stoves which kept the waters cozily warm for good times in the 4,000 public baths of fair Alexandria. They say, says Ibn al-Kifti, it took six months to burn them all. Aristotle's works, the only ones spared. Great concentrations of books, mostly found in centers of power, have been the main victims of total wars, attacks, sackings, and fires. Hence, what has come down to us is derived not from the great... A uh, student, uh, old, one of the first students of Chuggin Trungpa Rinpoche, Richard Arthur, who will uh, represent the Buddhist community. adapted from a poem that um, I was commissioned to write some 11 years ago on the occasion when Alan was retiring from full-time uh, faculty membership here to return to New York and, and come back since then every summer here. Uh, and it's called The Song of Dependent Origination for Alan Ginsberg. When I was 20, a student of literature at London University, reading Howl was like hearing the true and vibrant voice of America, the shock of recognition, oh, the intensity, shared experience of craziness and Baudelarian ecstasy. At 21, a young actor, I read that poem at midnight poetry reading at the Bayer Theatre in St. Andrews, Scotland, along with poems by Kerouac, Ferlinghetti, Corso, of Christmas teeth. The audience loved it and howled for more, though heaven knows it wasn't exactly the best minds of my generation saved by sanity. In 1968, with the Vajracharya on a trip to India, in the holy city of Benares, we encountered crazed American hippie pilgrim, exulting, awestruck at the very spot where Allen Ginsberg and Peter Orlovsky man got stoned with the sadhus. Look, man, right here. See? was on that trip at Tatsang in Bhutan. I had a clear and distinct vision of coming to America, told Rinpoche, and he said, yes, but I think perhaps Canada first. And sure enough, I came without choice to New York in 1970 and Rinpoche to Montreal, where he stayed in an apartment adorned with two large posters, one of Einstein, serene and humorous, and one of you, Alan, sporting stars and stripes and sandwich board of legalized pot. <laughs> and then just three months later on a burning sidewalk of New York City outside the Museum of Modern Art, then you were in person with your father, darting out from nowhere and jumping in our cab. Look, said Number J, it's Alan Ginsberg. <laughs> ah, no, said I, that's not him. <laughs> yes, said Number J, I think it is. So I had to challenge you and check. Excuse me, but you took our cab, and by the way, you're Alan Ginsberg, aren't you? So next day I phoned you, the famous cab thief, and you came to meet Rinpoche at Dawn's apartment, East 21st Street, fifth floor walk up. Do you remember? And you bought your harmonium and sang songs of Blake, and then we chanted, or rather sang, the sadhana of Mahamudra, a whole new way of doing it, harmoniumized with chords inevitability of connections and karmic ripening seeds leading from there to here to who knows what occasional encounters in New York TV studios and Dharma gatherings. And two years later in Vermont, you helped me acknowledge my hypocrisy and gave me the fall of America inscribed for Kunga Dawa, dirty liar and thanks for lies, Bodhisattva compassion to my suffering sweat, love Alan Ginsberg, Bodhisattva's action of profound poetic justice. 
Another decade slips away. Last night in Alfalfa's grocery, apparently by chance, we met again. Once one more link in the cosmic karmic chain of auspicious coincidence, and you had bags of fresh vegetables, more than you could carry, and I was able to be your taxi driver. Watch while you cut up leeks with a practiced hand. Listen while you praised the leafy carrot tops. Chop them into your stainless steel cauldron. Slivers of Blake, songs of experience. Alan the Alchemist, stirring life-giving soup. Organic ingredients, macrobiotic. Big life, big fish in the rubber pond. Grain of sand in big universe. Impossible to hide under bed. Proud pedophile, humble practitioner, always good friend. Welcome back, Alan. Welcome, Dharma brother. Please keep coming back to Boulder, writing whatever needs to be written, teaching whatever needs to be taught, singing whatever needs to be sung without doubt. Ah, ah, ah. For Alan Ginsberg, clean soothsayer, with thank Next read by, also representing the Buddhist and poetry communities, Library. Isn't it ironic that a king of spontaneity, defender of faith in non thought, true speech, Lord who unties the tongue in strong and shocking witness and response to current life, should be a library? Isn't it ironic that the confessor who purifies neurotic spells and bindings by speaking them, even glorifying them, even immortalizing them, who changes inertias in the minds of fearsome public us, whose non-existence is a famous maypole for many colored bands of anti-establishmentarianism, should be a library? Ironic? Misnomer? Doesn't life surprise us? Guests of the week is here today and uh, we'll be reading tonight with Alan, a uh, long uh, friend, long old friend of Alan Ginsberg. Please welcome Gary Snyder. I was already uh, in mind of the great library of Alexandria and its destruction. Uh, so it was interesting that uh, Anselm Holland touched on that. Uh, and I've primed to speak a moment on libraries because I actually did give a speech for the dedication of a library a couple of years ago. Uh, the new West Wing of the library at the University of California at Davis. I was roped into it by the chancellor. And I had a lot of fun thinking about that. I learned some things. Uh, for example, uh, that the library, uh, as we usually think of it, is a creation of the humanistic tradition. Aristotle was said to have the first major private library, which descended from his descendants, went on to his descendants. And the humanistic tradition has few, if any, second thoughts about the wisdom uh, and the utility of libraries. Uh, the humanistic tradition is uh, marked by information arrogance, you might say. Uh, and uh, uh, there is no uh, sense of the contradictory or playful uh, questioning of whether or not libraries serve as well. The humanistic tradition is entirely behind libraries, solidly so. But a number of our major religious traditions, uh, and this also has been touched on, uh, have been very suspicious of large accumulations of books or large accumulations of various sorts of secular knowledge. And I had no sense of humor about it at all. Uh, and uh, then finished off uh, a bit later by Muslims who, 
as Alan, uh, as Enzo said, used it to stoke the public baths. Uh, they had no appreciation of libraries. Uh, and there was a, a, a strong Christian contribution throughout uh, the Middle Ages and well into the Renaissance, and we still have it around today. Uh, dismissing the authority of this wonderful accumulation of uh, knowledge, wisdom, and miscellaneous information. On the other hand, Buddhism, uh, which also asserts, uh, as do some of these other traditions, that spiritual insight and life the has nonetheless supported the meeting libraries throughout its early career, and has done so enthusiastically and vigorously. Another indication of Buddhism's wonderful willingness uh, to tolerate apparent contradictions. Uh, the Chinese Zen Chan tradition, of course, uh, which has asserted quite vigorously a special transmission outside books and doctrines, uh, and has rigorously told people not to read their books and their, didn't ever say throw them away, did it? So just don't read them. As it has in practice over the centuries uh, uh, written an extraordinary quantity of books uh, and stashed them all away and they secretly love their vast literary output even though they tell students to look at it. Uh, so it is appropriate that uh, a library be dedicated to elder out there, walking around, looking out for food, a rootstock, a bird call, a seed that you can crack, plucking, digging, snaring, snagging, somehow getting by. No food out there on dusty slopes of screen. Carry some, look for some, go for a hungry dream. Deer bone, thou sheep. Bones, hunger, bone. Out there somewhere, a shrine for the old ones, the dust of the old bones, old songs and tales. What we ate, who ate what, how we all prevailed. Thank you. has composed over a hundred orchestral and chamber works, two operas, many scores for theater and films. He will also be performing later this evening, and he and Alan go way back as well. So please welcome David Amram. Such a treat to be here, to see something like this happening. I think for Lars Ferlinghetti, who will be here, Meredith Monk, Ken Kesey, who's here today, Gary Snyder, so many of us who are over the big 6-0, we just hope we'll be able to stay alive and survive and <coughs> be able to pursue <coughs> our dreams in life, not only to be artists, but to share what we knew as being artists with all the people we could come in contact with. All of us, Alan and all of us, come out of a generation that was inspired by artists who were older than us from another generation who had come out of the Depression, who had virtually nothing, who were given the option of having nothing, and who ex exhibited an extraordinary sense of generosity, caring, sharing, loving kindness, inspiration, and always had the time to talk to encourage a young person who dared to dream, who dared to go against the grain, who dared to try to do something beautiful, to do something different, and to do something meaningful for no apparent reason. Almost 40 years after I met Alan, he is now one of those people who is being honored, but during the 40 years that I've known him, he has always found the time, whether we were playing concerts in New York City, having tear gas bombs thrown at us at countless demonstrations, or on street corners and coffee houses, or on blocks where people would come up who were strangers and talk to him, or where we played a jazz poetry 
revisited at the ANS department store in the lingerie section in Brooklyn, <laughs> celebrating the very first jazz poetry reading ever in New York City, which I did with Jack Kerouac in 1957. Whatever the situation was, Alan always found and still finds the time to share a few precious moments of himself with others, to encourage people to go for it, to dare to dream, to dare to improvise, and let those who are uninspired criticize, to give the opportunity to someone to think that they can be something, to say as the religion that we were brought up with, to be an al Kadush Hashem, to be an example for others by how you act rather than by what you say of what one should do by setting the example yourself. Having a library named after him is so beautiful because this can be a library that's open where people can come in and read books and try to find out the inspiration and the information of knowledge and culture that goes way, way back to the set back in a book form, because all books come out of oral history, folk knowledge, and hangoutology, by the knowledge <laughs> all of us gain from those who don't get their names in the books, but gave us the knowledge. So every writer of consequence and every poet of consequence is someone who bears witness to those thousands of people who don't get the recognition. So I'm sure all of you will come in and use the library, and that would be the greatest honor for Alan, to share the wisdom. Also. We have to remember those, the generations that we came out of who were not here, to have a thank you said for them. Charlie Parker and Dizzy Gillespie, who I met in 51 and 52, who had the same inspiration and the same attitude that Alan did. The great composer, Edgar Varese, the painter, Franz Klein, and of course the person without whom none of us would be here, Jack Kerouac. So we thank you for being here. Thank the school for honoring one of our real American original artists before he's retired and before he's expired to encourage all the young people here that you can go for it, that you can do it, and that you should try to. And if you ask someone's opinion and they snub you, that means they are ignorant and you don't need to hang out with them anyway. <laughs>
Moses and Lowell. He used to talk about his interest not only in the West of the United States, but his own Native American or Indian roots from Canada that he had lost. And what a dream it would be to come to the Rockies. Alan, coming from Newark, also had those same dreams. I, coming from a farm in Feasterville, Pennsylvania, dreamed of someday getting here. And this is a piece of music that's from this part of the country, from the earth, and again brings the East and the West and the United States into one place. The people who are going to be performing with me are going to be in the concert, Alan and Gary Snyder, and others are going to be doing tonight, including the great poet from the New York Eagle Village, which is there. So I'd like to invite How to I know I am now. poet, sculptor, actor, Northeast coordinator for American Indian Movement. You've seen it before, reading Jack's poetry and reading the NYU Mr. Jeff Carpentier, of the Street Walk. Mr. Bernard Hill, of the Street Walk. Mr. Jeff Champlain, also the frame drum. He did this in Taos, New Mexico for the first time, but he's played with Tito Puente, Machito, and Ella Garner. The master of all musics came all the way out to Golden to help us out. Mr. Victor Banegas. A young woman who grew up loving Jack's works because she heard them all read to her as a baby, and knows Alan's poetry, and she's wearing a Charlie Parker t-shirt, so life moves on from generation to generation. My daughter, Elana Amrit. <laughs> but she doesn't have it finished yet. And also, another appreciator of Alan, as all generations do, my son, Adam. So this is a friend and family tribute to Alan Ginsberg, the one and only, and all of you here at Naropa and in Boulder. Good times, good vibes, a good library, and good healthy thoughts. It's a Sue or Makota round dance song, Floyd Red Pro Westerman taught me to this 24 years ago when we first started playing. I used it in a piece I wrote for the Philadelphia Orchestra, because like Jack and Alan, I tried to use the European tradition along with the indigenous, magnificent materials that we have right here in this culture, which have been ignored for most of the century by the intellectual community, much to their lack, and are now being appreciated. It's a wonderful dance called Mastin Chalabachipe. This is a Sioux Kordi flute called the Shiho. We're going to play for you, Ladies' Choice Round Dance. <laughs>
Andy Clausen, and after him, Antler will read. Uh, also guests of our conference this week. <coughs> First of all, I'd like to thank Alan personally for inspiring me to write poetry. That's kind of a what if. If I had never read Alan, would I have been a poet? I don't think so. But, uh, and I also would like to thank him for teaching me after I did meet him. And especially I'd like to thank him for the fact that no matter how much recognition and notoriety he gets, he still keeps burning bright his love for the common people. Now, there's a Slavic word called pozor. Yeah, the first time I saw it was in Slovenia and there was, it was with a Rottweiler. So we figured it meant dog. Every time we'd see a dog, a little dog, we'd say, Pozor, Pozor. People kind of laughed at us. Didn't know until I, why? Until I saw it on a, um, the doors to a trolley. It meant danger, beware, not dog. And then, uh, and then when I got to Prague, I was stepping off a curb and I kind of stumbled and the man said, Pozor. But in Russia, the word goes on to mean shame and they yell at it at politicians. Blues, Pozor Blues, Pozor Buddha Blues. I'm a blues man. I love the blues so much, I always have them. They hang on me like arms. They're heavier than my legs. I know my brain bleeds and my head shrinking as it gains weight. And the middle of my body, the middle of my body divests me of all Calvinistic ambitions. I know, I know, I know, I know I shouldn't feel cheated. I've been hip to the self-evident logic of this European living in the USA, taking on the tradition of another continent, made slave in the USA, abused and stymied to this day, in this night. It was more than money's deification and defecation give us the blues. It was more than a buyout gave the blues to the survivors of land crazed genocide. It wasn't so long ago. The blues are intended to transcend the blues. We wanted air to dance in, not what's burned a hole in the ozone. We didn't give a darn for mining gold or uranium, drilling for oil. When we had other animals, the land was free. Uncontaminated water could make love outdoors. We hadn't made manhood and womanhood the war they'd become. And knowing this, I should be harbinger of glorious fundamental change. Being a good man is not enough. I'm too blue to try again. The blues taught me the meaning of should, the need of it, if you would. The blues make pitiful amounts of money an all-consuming part of my life. From Bangkok shanty towns and bistros to the uncertain old eyes of Praha focused in their supermarkets beyond what there is. From the shoeless bronchial homeless winter streets of New Delhi the shoeless bronchial homeless winter streets of New York. There's enough food and land to grow it, but there's not enough money. The tools, the machinery, the technology waiting in the stores. The workers are anxious to make more so their children can go to college and have an education and not have to give up the life as we know it. They can have rivers and mountains too. Uh, who could think of war as the answer? What do they envision the outcome? Now I'd like to end this on a high, warm, child-bearing note. A mild triumph, a mild crescendo of the triumph of beauty. But I got the blues, the pose of Buddha. I can't seem to shake. No one I can't quake out of these pose of Buddha blues. Thanks again. celebration, meditation. One, when I was in grade school, the teacher made a point of pointing out 
library was supposed to be pronounced library and not library. <laughs> and I thought, shouldn't it be called truth -brary? A place where truths are buried and not lies buried? <laughs> so that people go there to exhume truths, not lies? Two. To the stonecutters by Robinson Jeffers. Stonecutters fighting time with marble. You, four defeated challengers of oblivion, eat cynical earnings, knowing rock splits, records fall down, the square-limbed Roman letters scale in the thaws, where in the rain. The poet as well builds his monument mockingly, for man will be blotted out, the blithe earth die, the brave sun die blind and blackened to the heart. Yet stones have stood for a thousand years, and pained thoughts found the honey of peace in old poem. So may this library stand a thousand years, so when three thousand years, it still houses the honey of peace in old poems that are young now. Three, may the spirit of the Whitman Ginsburg branch of the poetry tree grow and breathe here. Shut not your doors, proud libraries, by Walt Whitman. Shut not your doors to me, proud libraries, for that which was lacking on all your well-filled shelves, yet needed most, I bring. Forth from the war emerging, a book I have made. The words of my book, nothing. The drift of it, everything. A book separate, not linked with the rest, nor felt by the intellect, but you, ye untold latencies will thrill to every page. For in his poem, America, Ginsburg asked, America, why are your libraries full of tears? May this library be full of more than tears, full of laughter of children, come cries of lovers, sage visions of elders, sunlight on mountaintops, and tears in the sense of what Virgil called sunt lacrima rerum, the tears of things. And may the tomes herein inspire poets, orators, musicians, and meditators to come to help relieve the tears of future worlds. Five, for Ellen, by Ellen. In 1958, when Ellen and Peter went to Père Lachaise Cemetery in Paris to visit Apollinaire's grave. Ginsburg wrote that just as he came to, quote, pay tender homage to his helpless men here and lay my temporary American howl on top his silent calligram for him to read between the lines with x-ray eyes of poet, I hope some wild kid monk lay his pamphlet on my grave for God to read me on cold winter nights in heaven. Six, for the trees from whose butchered flesh our books are made, each year a tree gets new genitals, and not just one, but thousands. Some trees have hundreds of thousands of penises, some trees have hundreds of thousands of vaginas. Some have hundreds of thousands of penises and vaginas. Whereas a human being only gets one. One vagina or one penis that's born and grows to puberty, blossoms, exults in ripeness, slowly withers and dies. To think a redwood that's 2,000 years old gets hundreds of thousands of fresh, new, perfectly formed young male and female genital flowers every year that mate to become cones, cones with seeds in them as virile 
as when at age 70 the redwood was first able to bear mature seeds. Whereas by the time we're 70, our seed's virility, quantity, trajectory is past, and each year decrescendos toward death, the beauty, potency, majesty of our genital blooms. But then a tree's seeds are not really seeds. The seeds that fall from a tree are not really seeds, but embryos. The seeds were pollen on anthers, on stamens of tree flowers, that when she watched snow on the ground, ice on the windows, this is for you. Early winter, the sky a gray slate, the wind slings black birds along. I think to live a simple life, and when I've gone, the wind will blow it all away. My particular syndrome is I wait for solutions to show themselves. My symptoms are I hold on to what I think will see me through. My refusal to pay disaster what it deserves is my disease. The way I keep living my life as if nothing has gone wrong. He doesn't think it is a joke because he has no sense of humor. If he had a sense of humor, he'd be surprised by how often he'd need it. <laughs> I don't have anything to say, but thought I'd call anyway. How are you? Has your life got straight, your health, your love, your plans for your future, which is gone by now? Of a library and archives, is that we compost the elegant thoughts and words of those who have come before. We close with some lines from Walt Whitman's This Compost. What chemistry, that the winds are really not infectious, that this is no cheat, this transparent green wash of the sea, which is so amorous after me, that it is safe to allow it to lick my naked body all over with its tongues, that it will not endanger me with the fevers that have deposited themselves in it, that all is clean forever and ever, that the cool drink from the well tastes so good, that blackberries are so flavorous and juicy, that the fruits of the apple orchard and the orange orchard, that melons, grapes, peaches, plums, will none of them poison me, that when I recline on the grass, I do not catch any disease, though probably every spear of grass rises out of what was once a catching disease. Now I am terrified at the earth. It is that calm and patient. It grows such sweet things out of such corruptions. It turns harmless and stainless on its axis with such endless successions of diseased corpses. It distills such exquisite winds out of such infused fetor. It renews with such unwitting looks its prodigal, annual, sumptuous crops. It gives such divine materials to men and accepts such leavings from them at last. Thank you very, very much for joining us. In this I had a choice of doing one or the other, and I did a Why this one? Uh, well, we're doing Cluster tomorrow night. Uh -huh. uh, it's the best work of its kind ever come out, and I thought we might as well offer it to uh, some people who would appreciate it. Besides, Ginsburg uh -huh. has promised to play Buddha Whitman. Buddha Whitman. Uh -huh. Why do it here, though? I mean, why pick Kamarama? Well, I've always liked Coors beer. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's obvious. It's, uh, this is... Uh, 
This is the Greenwich Village of the uh, late 90s. It is. You know, you put something in mind in your book, Garage Set. I wanted to thank you. I hadn't seen you. I'm Jan Scott. I used to do a magazine called Country Senses. I know. I used to be in Bob Bath. Oh, is that right? Oh, yeah. So <laughs> somebody walked by and said, you know, you're in a in garage sale. So I didn't do that. So, uh, yeah, thanks. But, uh, oh, yeah, I'm, all of us have worked long and hard on this uh, uh, work. And, uh, particularly one yes, so that's you see it. These people meaning who? Well, the yeah. Buddhist riffraff, vulgar uh, <laughs> riffraff. <laughs> lots of old friends uh -huh. and lots of new friends. Does anything ever annoy you? Yeah. 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 Bad poetry. Yeah. <laughs> bad bad self-indulgent, uh, inward-looking poetry always annoys me. <laughs> Have you heard me yet while you've been here? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A couple times. You can talk, usually tell. That's when you're going to talk to Alan about that. Wouldn't do any good. He says, you know, shit on a piece of paper. Of <laughs> <laughs> and he's right in a way, but I don't care to read it. Yeah. Or no. hear it. Or hear it. Did you bring uh, your bus with you this time? We we Perfect. did, but it uh, we lost the clutch in Idaho. How many on the bus? Nine. Hmm. Uh, and. The rest of the cast and band are arriving tonight. What, what year is that? What is it? Uh, what is it? 94. Uh, your bus is, a, is, it, is it the old for Oh, no, I thought you said what? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, it's 47. 47, it's what? A 47, diamond? 47, uh, okay. International Harvester. Mm -hmm. We used to have a dump truck like that. Uh, we, we changed the motor just before uh, we had it out. It was a mistake because. Her sutures hadn't healed up after the motorectomy, and uh, she, <laughs> she began to hemorrhage as we started up over the mountains and, and voicing. Does she have a chance for any more trips, or is this? Oh yeah, she'll be fine. She'll be fine. But, but I won't push her over the Rockies. <laughs> you ever hear from Sandy Lehmanhaupt anymore? Is Sandy Lehmanhaupt called not long ago, and wrote it not long ago, and said, "If there's any money ever made, I want remuneration." <laughs> <laughs> Nine of the books. Right. Yeah, and she yeah, there is. A, they said more are coming. More are coming. There are, is a band called Jam Band that plays with us, yeah. and uh, there are kids in the, in the play, and they're coming with their grandparents. What do you do for fun when you're here the whole week? Uh, I didn't come here for fun. No, this is work. Uh huh. This is work, and I wouldn't squander the fun. I don't think I'll climb up in the uh, flat irons or uh -huh. do any of that stuff. We're, it's going to be back to back. Uh, I want to have fun. I stay in Oregon. <laughs> Although, truly, Boulder is always fun. Yeah. Boulder's a trip. When was the last time you saw Oregon? Oh, last year. Oh, just last year? Yeah. yeah. I traveled across uh, Poland uh, last fall. Last winter, I guess. And uh, Alan had just gone ahead of me in all these places where I read. And I felt like I came into a place where the ground had been freshly tilled. <laughs> and it was fertile, and all I had to do was drop seeds and keep moving. The Ginsburg had plowed the land ahead of me. Wonderful. And everywhere we went, they were astounded at the size of the crowds we were getting in Europe, in Prague, and Warsaw, and so forth. And you know why? Those people didn't get the 60s. Yeah. How would you like to have not had the 60s? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they were on a crash program in the 60s. Are you still farming? Sure. Yeah, uh, yeah I got a. I, my wife is doing it now. We just got the hay in, just in time to head off on this, this thing. Uh, yeah, we got a big herd of cows. Suddenly, eight shoes. They're still working. Farrakhan. Let's see what's on the back of it. This is it. This is it. Uh, this at, uh, did you check that out? That's one of my heroes. <laughs> I didn't even know you knew it. It's one of my zeros. <laughs> What are your what? One of my zeros. One of my heroes and one of my zeros. Uh, yeah, this this play that we're doing, I'm especially uh, happy to be doing it here in Boulder. Uh -huh. um, it's about the end of the world, the, the end of the century, the end of the millennium, and the beginning of we know not what. But. My feeling is that unless you acknowledge these things, that you never have uh, any kind of power. It's the same as painting the mastodon on the cave wall. You've got to do it to keep it from scaring you to death. And 
tornadoes doubled in 1991 and doubled again in 1992. Um, PB is rising three times faster than at any time in history. Uh, we're creating new diseases like you can't believe. And the earthquakes are getting worse and worse, and that's what the thing is about. It's about weather, disease, and earthquakes and volcanoes, and uh, what you can do to survive them. And I call it a musical catastrophe. Uh, and when it works, by the end of the uh, show, everybody is on their feet and screaming. Uh, the idea is to have a show that works the audience into the show. We're, when it comes to the end, of the closing of the show, they are part of it and making as much noise as they can possibly make. Okay. And singing with each other and dancing with each other and drumming and carrying on. And when it works, sometimes we'll just go away and come back an hour later and it's still going. <laughs> it's coming like anything. And you're doing this when you're performing this? Tomorrow night Tomorrow? after the fireworks. Oh, okay, great. Do you, you think those old uh, radical uh, environmentalists are right about the uh, eco-eruptions and all of that? you think that's gonna, actually going to happen? I don't know. I really have no idea what's going to happen. I do know that shit is happening. Uh, it's not that shit happens, but it is happening. It's happening all around us, and, and we need to acknowledge it. And I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing. When that uh, flood hit the Mississippi. Uh, Isn't that stuff always been happening? I don't like yeah. that either. Well, not like now. Right now with these video cameras, you're ringside on volcanoes. You're ringside down inside of the uh, tornadoes. Uh, we use projections on the back of the, uh, our backdrop to do the show. And the projections are of uh, tornadoes. We're, we're seeing and learning more about tornadoes than anybody in history because of these cameras. They go everywhere, you can pick up everything. Uh, of earthquakes, the look in people's faces, the look in people's faces after that flood in Mississippi. Suddenly, there's sanity in the face. There's sanity. They're not trying to worry about gays in the military or they're not worrying about who's the county commissioner. They're worrying about getting this piece of rock over here and putting this bag full of sand over here and whoever you are, racially or sexually, could be less important at that point. When something comes around like that, something happens to us that is wonderful. Are you going up to Wyoming to the uh, rainbow gathering? A lot of people have asked that. Yeah. Uh, we, we picked up some girls on the way to the rainbow gathering. That's when the bus got pissed off. <laughs> I said, I thought we had higher aims than this. <laughs> That's when she said, this is it. And he pulled over to the side and said, get those girls off me. Are, are you involved in the new uh, whole Earth catalog with Hugh Romney? Are you ever see him anymore? Oh, yeah. The hog yeah. Uh, Every run, we, we did Twister down at uh, uh, the Fillmore. Uh, for the reopening of Fillmore West, and uh, I saw a lot of old friends down there. You're not, are you going to go to Woodstock this year? No, I didn't go to the first one. I don't know why I want to go to the second one. Uh, I'm not that big on enormous crowds. I, uh, I enjoy a crowd you can be in touch with. And, you get really huge crowds. Pretty soon things are being run by the guys that own the equipment. So, is, you think there's another trip for the Merry Pranksters? I mean, uh, unannounced. This is even in disguise, this is it. All of these same people are here. Uh, Ken Babs, George Walker, Roy Sieber, and a whole bunch are here. They play the Babs plays Thor and Frankenstein. George Walker's the Tin Man. I'm Oz. Uh, yeah, it's, it's the same old bunch of people. We all live within 10 minutes of each other up in Eugene uh, and continue with our lives. Babs is raising his ninth kid and I just got my last kid out of college. And, uh, yeah, we continue to do the same thing. Here's another one. How about you and Kurt Douglas? Did you guys ever get it straightened out on that movie deal in the novel? Oh, I never held any argument with Kurt. It was his not no son that bothered me. <laughs> which, which one? Uh, what's his name? Uh, Michael. Michael. Uh, yeah, I, I sued and got a little money, and I wouldn't have if I hadn't sued. The guy that I sued is Saul Zance. It wasn't Douglas. It was Saul Zance, the same guy that uh, owns Creedence Clearwater. 
and Thelonious Monk. Uh, all that stuff here, that's why Creedence Clearwater can't be Creedence Clearwater anymore because Saul Dent says he owns it. And they it's wouldn't they wouldn't give me any. It's interesting when I read that book and I saw the hospital, I was in a hospital just like that for drugs in the nineteen sixties. Pretty amazing. Oh yeah. They, they oh, haven't you changed that much. Them. Yeah, I worked I wrote it while I was working on a board. Nursing homes too, that's that's the thing that's just a disaster. Yeah. And we're having more and more guys. older and older people in those nursing homes. My grandmother's hundred and two and she's in there. And they're it's pretty good. She, her face is always bright and her hair is nicely combed and she smells okay. You go and see her? Yeah, she's got Alzheimer's. She's there. When I take my grandkids in and they touch her cheeks, she goes, oh, oh. And when a big person touches her, she doesn't do that. But she knows that's a kid. And so that part of her is still there. And that's a big part of it. Yeah, I, you know, we really don't know what's going on inside of somebody. And you always ought to treat them as though they're still in full capacity. It'd be a real drag to be lying there and not be able to do anything and have three people talking about you. you smell like an old mop. <laughs> <laughs> people lose hope in those places, you know. They go in and they fall the first time and end up in a wheelchair. Well, that's and, why we need uh, legalized marijuana. Legalized marijuana would solve so many of this nation's problems. If OJ had smoked a good joint, he wouldn't have done that. <laughs> you know, that, that's coke and steroids talking. That's coke, steroids, self-pity, and ego. You smoke a joint and pretty soon you say, oh, what the fuck, maybe I'll kill her tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> I can see what you do. Come up there, okay, now you, you, you won't have to leave this. Mm -hmm. Did you guys drive across the country in this Cadillac? Well, we'll leave it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it'll take a while to drive. Maybe just fold that one around. Yeah, I'll just hold it. What's that? It's a going machine. This one. Yeah, I race them. You race Cadillacs? I race Cadillacs. I race stock cars on dirt. Huh? Everybody else races Camaros, and I race Cadillacs. Well, good for you. What do you usually get a coupe? Well, I get a four-door. Four-doors are the best. 501 or 472. It's got a 501. I'm Jan Scott. How you doing? Good. Ken Bass. Ken Bass. Yeah, I like those big four-door cats. Frankenstein here. Yeah, they're a lot of fun. And when if a Chevy hits you, they bounce off of you. No, after. And they handle, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. They handle, right? I get dressed Out in Oregon there in Dexter Lake, when they drain it, you know, they drain the race, they make these big mud flats out there, and they have mud flat races every winter. Boy, they fun. They got a whole course laid out through this mud. Do you race in We got one together one year. It was a Ford Fairlane four-door. Oh, like an enduro race kind of thing? or? Yeah, so many times we're on the course, and it's a combination. That's it. Combination, uh, uh, demolition. destruction, dem yeah, yeah, demolition yeah. derby, and, and race. The, right, right. the one car to get through the finish line first. 72 wins. Cadillac or three or four with a four. That's part of racing. Oh, yeah. Those are the good ones. <laughs> Father Frankenstein. Is there any T for a marriage ceremony? Oh, yeah, sure. 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 We'll charge you more. Okay. We'll see you tomorrow. You okay. guys okay. might find us friends. Okay. okay. <laughs> Uh, long, pretty long. I'm not going to tell her, right? Well, she's got to wear something. I flew. I flew. You flew? I flew. Well, I flew. I did see you. I I know. I'll get it. You mentioned it in the note. I like that note. Something broad, something blue. Okay. Something rancid, something new. What year is this? Is it 75, 76, 73? This is an Eldorado convertible. Yeah, this is unusual. It's front wheel drive. Oops. Right? Front wheel drive, yeah. Yeah, I know. Sometimes more, Well, y'all come back. Oh, yeah. We're going to be here all week. Yeah, I know. Did you say that? Bye. It ain't further, but it'll work. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the Mary Pranksters or Aaron Boulder, they're driving around in the 73 Cadillac. You're watching this all incidentally on uh, Jan Scott tonight.